the Minneapolis and St. Louis subsidiary Iowa Central Railroad to Point South, leaving Minneapolis, leaving Minneapolis, major station stops, Mason City, Mason City, Marshalltown, flag stop at Gilman, Oskaloosa, Mammoth, and Peoria, Peoria Gateway to the East, train number eight, coaches up front, Coaches up front, dining car, dining car, special parlor car for the patrons of the Marshalltown Library with snacks and adult beverages. <laughs> Pullman to the rear, Pullman to the rear, leaving on track two. All aboard number eight to point south on the Iowa Central subsidiary, Minneapolis and St. Louis. All aboard. Now, I had, oh, thank you, thank you. My favorite joke is, may I remove my hat? And if the glare gets too much, just raise your hands. You know, we want to see the photos, okay? You know, when you're looking at, and, and when I got into writing the railroads of World War I, <coughs> there was this um, one book that was self-published. It really wasn't, but it was just printed. And all it talked about was uh, the period of time when the government took over the railroads. We're going to look at that in a moment. And I said, okay, th that book was written, you know, 50, 60 years ago. It really isn't complete at all. I mean, the fellow who did it did a great job. But it really wasn't complete. And I said to myself, let me see what I can dig up. Well, as I started digging, you know, as an historian, you're digging up, the, you know, it was like a mine shaft where one mine shaft led to another. And I found out, my goodness, the United States, the United States operated trains in France during World War I. Okay, there was just one sentence that I found in another book saying that, well, that book has yet to be written. Okay, fine. And then as I was researching that, they said, well, a number of men were deployed to operate trains in Russia. And I said, what the heaven's name is that? I think I said something else. <laughs> and I started researching that and found out the United States, the United States operated the Trans-Siberian Railroad for the Russians. And other railroads in Russia for the Russians at the Russian invitation. So wait a minute. You know, there's nothing like this stuff in the history books. There's nothing, nothing about this. Here's our, here's our first photo. And this is taken in the hills of Virginia on the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad. And if you notice, of course, we have the hills back, back here. I think this is at Clifton Forge. And I say that because of the bridge in back there. It's been re that bridge has been replaced with the new bridge. But I want you to notice these were soldiers going off to war, going off to camp and to war. And look at the luggage they were carrying. It wasn't that way probably in your memories. It was you will present yourself. Not you will present yourself with your luggage. A lot of them took their dogs, cats, and canaries. That's right. The army had no limit of what they could bring to camp and then, ta then take with them to Europe in the early days of the war. That stopped quickly, you can imagine. Right? But they had this baggage. They were loading the baggage as the men were getting ready to get on the... the the Chesapeake and Ohio cars uh, to go off to camp and then and then to go off to war in in, in Europe. Okay. okay, these are Red Cross volunteers. The Red Cross set up over 600 canteens at railroad stations in the United States, and they served the typical coffee and donuts, sandwiches, and so forth to the men, and th that were th in this case. Uh, where, where they appeared, where these ladies appeared, these were men that were going off to Europe. In other words, they weren't going to the camp because the, when people were drafted, when the men were, I should probably say, when the men were drafted, the army supplied the lunches and food on their way to the camp, okay? But these were the men being taken to the eastern ports, uh, uh, particularly in New Jersey and onto New York, and then on to Newport News, Virginia, um, to be sent overseas 
And at this point, they would have only their rifle, bar you know, their equipment with them, no food. They would, or sometimes just rations. That, uh, but these ladies would then appear to bring here in this case sandwiches and and uh, donuts, uh, coffee, and then in the summer they would change over to ice cream and watermelon. Okay, you know, for, for the summer months, you know, cool. Because they didn't have air conditioning back then, see? So they wanted to keep the soldiers cool. And they would dress appropriately. You see the cross on this one lady, one lady, but they would try to dress uh, in these types of, is a train coming? That's music, isn't it? Okay, we'll go to the next one. Okay. Uh, there really was a problem feeding the men on the long distance trains. And the army came up with this ingenious idea that didn't work. <laughs> I'm sure you heard about that before, Inge ingenious ideas that don't work. Where they actually put these field kitchens on flat cars. And here was the cook with the, with the, with the field kitchen. And he's gonna try to cook for the men on the train. And this really turned out to be a mess. Uh, the Pullman Company actually offered to make special dining cars just for the troops. To, and they would be able to serve, they claim, over 400 men an hour. The Army turned them down. They said, well, this is cheaper. Well, and they found out that it just didn't work. They just couldn't feed numbers of men. And a lot of the men just, you know, opened up their rations. And finally, the Army gave up and just gave them rations to eat on the train. And where they would stop, they would get some coffee and the Red Cross. That's why the Red Cross ladies were really looked upon favorably. You know, they really had good food and coffee for the men. Because this thing just, just didn't work. You hear so much about the United States not getting into World War I. And I found that that was a fable. By the time of the end of winter, uh, 19, 19, 1917, after the... Uh, the, uh, after elections and so forth, on into January, uh, January ni 1917, that February, that most Americans wanted to get in the war. We really wanted to get in the war. And when our National Guard was called up and when our men were drafted, scenes like this were fairly common, that all the relatives and the whole town would turn out to see the men off either to camp or if they came home on furlough or, you know, at home. Because what they tried to do was get as many, many men home for Christmas 1917 as possible. The whole town turned out to send them off, to cheer, to cheer, them, to cheer them on. Here you can see some of the old buggies there. Uh, this is in Wahoo, Nebraska. This is from the Nebraska Historical Society. But this scene, and I have scenes in my book, were all throughout the country, from big cities to small towns where everyone supported the war. Everyone would come and greet the soldiers and send them off. When they returned to the war, from the war, they were all greeted as heroes, parades all over the place. So this is just one scene in Wahoo. We're gonna see another one. By the way, if you're curious, that's Chicago Northwestern. So that train probably came through Marshalltown. Another scene, uh, the same thing in Wahoo, uh, again, Chicago Northwestern, how everybody turned out to, to see the men off on the train uh, as, as they were going to uh, camp or going off to war, whichever, whichever it was. I like those old cars, too. Um, Wahoo, again, look at this, people climbing in the windows. Look at the baggage and so forth huh, that they had. Look at everybody crowded there to get one last wave to the young men going off to war, huh? They really were supportive. The men went over and, and they said they were gonna do it. They were gonna bring the war to the end. And they did. That's the thing. The United States won World War I. If the United States did not get into World War I, the Germans would have won. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. During World War I, the United States government is going to take over the large railroads in the United States, the class ones. They're gonna rent them by agreement. They're gonna take them over. And what they did was they said that, okay, we're gonna take over and we are gonna run the railroads, not the companies. And on top of that, we're gonna have only certain types of locomotives built. 
so that those locomotives will have interchangeable parts and the government can move locomotives from one part of the country to another, not to worry about what any, whatever railroad company, okay? And this was identified by that U.S., United States Railroad Administration. And then above the U.S., on top of the tender here, would be the name of the railroad, particularly railroad that rented that locomotive. In this case, it was the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad that rented this locomotive, was responsible for its payment and for its rent. But this locomotive could be used out in California, it could be used in Louisiana, it could be used any place. Government could move it any, any, any place it wanted. And uh, it had to, had to meet all specifications. In fact, this was the beginning of efficiency studies in plant management. And the efficiency study said you have interchangeable parts. So all of this style locomotive was all built the same. Up until World War I, locomotives were built individually. There were works of art built individually. Now they're all built to scale. They're all built to exact specifications. This, uh, uh, I don't know how well you can see all the numbers here, but this said that all, what they were saying that there are 12 different classes of locomotives all had to be built with these particular specifications. Every locomotive like this had to be built with these specifications so that you could have interchangeable headlights, interchangeable Johnson gears, you know, and reversers, interchangeable throttles, interchangeable whistles. Take off one whistle for one locomotive this class, put on another. No longer individual locomotives being built. And so the government would issue, these are the specifications. Even the weight had to be exact. In fact, they would make a locomotive of one weight and they would, they would make that same locomotive several thousand pounds lighter. And that's so a railroad that didn't have the trestles that could carry the weight of the heavier locomotive could buy the same style locomotive, interchangeable parts, but lighter, so it could go over their tre trestles and tracks. Also, the pounds of rail. The heavier the rail, the heavier the locomotive and, and freight you could have on it, okay? So the government wanted to make sure that they were, all the locomotives were going to be the same, so the government would issue, here it is, the Baldwin Locomotive Works. Here, this is what this class standards said, standard locomotive. That's what they were looking for. And they standardized locomotives. Was is das? What is this? <laughs> Whoa, this is not a standard. Yes, it is. Actually, this is a narrow gauge locomotive. This is a 60 centimeter track. It's like 23 and some odd inches, 60 centimeters. This was the narrow gauge railroad that was operated for about 20 miles from the front. They would have the standard gauge trains come up to what they call a regulating station, which was a huge warehouse. Huge, 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 huge warehouse. And that was 20, 25 miles from the front. But they had to get the goods from the warehouse to the front. They didn't want to use standard gauge, so they used narrow gauge. And these were narrow gauge steam locomotives. They were tank engines. You know what a tank engine where it has its water here on both sides, huh? And of course the coal was in the bunker here. They were only, they were only, go, only gonna go about 20 miles at most, okay? They would go near the front and then they would loop around, drop off their cargo, and then return back to the regulating station. And the United, uh, the, the French and the British we're already using the 60 centimeters from 1914 to the time the United States got there. But when we got there, we were given our section, and the French said, hey, we already have the track there, and the Americans look at the track and said, this track is flimsy. So we rebuilt all the track. We brought in stronger locomotives. And now you want to hear something. This, this was a farming gauge in Europe. Get this. The Germans had the same 60 centimeter track. And when the front moved back and forth, they used, to all, they used each other's track. 
In some cases, they would t try to capture a locomotive, so they capture a German locomotive. So you wanted this narrow gauge so you could put the track down quickly and take it up quickly. Okay? Okay? Can you hear me all right? All right? Can you hear me okay? Okay. Okay, I know I don't have the microphone with me. Maybe, maybe I should have the microphone. Okay, Katie? Give me the, the mic, mic, mic. Yeah. So you can see here on this one, it's a different angle. Yeah, maybe this is a, maybe this is a little better for you, okay? Okay, you see a different angle. See, it says USA on there. Not United States America, United States Army. Okay, this is Army. Okay, this is a small, this is smaller version. This is a gasoline mechanical. It had two gears going forward and one gear in reverse. And there were two varieties of these. One was 50 horsepower and the other was about 25 horsepower. The, the 25 horsepower could probably pull one at most two cars. The 50 horsepower could probably three cars, narrow gauge cars. And they used these, get this, when they got several miles, just a couple of miles from the front, because when there was a buildup of supplies or men for a battle, the Germans could see and count the number of locomotives approaching the front because of the fires, you know? So they said, well, use these gasoline mechanicals because they don't have fire. What did they do? They clanged and make all kinds of noise. <laughs> so forget about that. But they use these gas gasoline mechanicals, okay? They, they, were, they were pretty good. I mean, they, they, did, they did their job. They did their job. And here's another side of it. Here you say USA, US Army, uh, smaller version of what, that's the gasoline tank up there. Uh, usually they would have a run from the steam locomotive to the front of maybe about three or four miles to the front and then back, pick up more cars, bring it to the front, loop around, and then go back. This is another locomotive. Yeah, a hand car with a little gasoline engine in there. There, there is a larger, smaller version. This was very simple. You put it on the track, you pushed it, it started, you jumped on. Okay? You stopped it with your foot. Put it in neutral, stopped it with your foot, and then reversed it if you wanted to go back. If it went off the track, you picked it up, put it on the track, and pushed it and got it going. Yeah. This, this was for officers. <laughs> <clears throat> well, you know, what do you expect? No, and no, it did not have a dining car attached, okay? No. This is probably so you can see it more cleanly. That's the lever, front, back. <laughs> that was it, front and back, uh, and that's how it went. You just hung on for dear life. This is a typical narrow gauge box car. They found out very quickly that the box cars could only be filled maybe two thirds, because if they filled it more, it would derail, simply whoomp off the track. So they learned very quickly with the narrow gauge that they really could not fill the water cars or the box cars, food cars, ammunition cars, they had special cars built for ammunition, that they couldn't fill them completely because they would derail. Let this sink in a second. These are the lucky guys. This is how they were transported from the front to the regulating station to be put on a hospital train. Those who were very seriously or mortally wounded were taken by ambulance. So these guys were wounded, but their wounds as determined by triage were not uh, that they would not die from that wound immediately. In other words, they could uh, spend a day's trip on the way to the hospital. And by the way, the United States, we built our own hospitals in France during World War I. And they would have a very, very good record. Okay. Just to give you an idea, some of the cannon that were by, transported by train, we got a big one coming up in a minute. Um, this is, this you can see those gasoline mechanicals. The United States had its own logging operation in the Vosges Mountains. 
and they needed the wood for fence posts to build their hovels uh, up near the front, wood for, for all kinds of pur purposes. Uh, we tended to use steel ties on the narrow gauge, and when we built the standard gauge, we did use wooden ties. So we had to supply ourselves, and the French said, go into the Vosges Mountains and go and get all the wood you want. So we actually had a whole logging operation with our own logging railroad up in the area. We, we did the whole thing. No, no French were there. We did the whole thing. Okay, this is one of my favorites. This uh, is from the Knights of Columbus. And this is a little uh, track at the front. Okay, this is at the front. And this, that track is about 15 inches, 14 something inches, okay? The gauge. So what happened is they would unload the narrow gauge but they still had to move the artillery shells, food, ammunition, supplies, everything around the front area. So they had a little trolley, or a little tram, if you will, that was hand pushed. They even had a little turntable for them uh, where they would put, put things to get ready to be put on the narrow gauge. Now, the Knights of Columbus uh, would take a, a narrow gauge box car and make what they called a hut out of it where they gave free refreshments to the soldiers in the front. Uh, the Red Cross had huts, by the way, at the front, but they, had, but they charged for the coffee and what they gave the soldiers. So everyone went, obviously, to the Knights of Columbus where they got it for free. And here you could see they were tending to a wounded soldier. He's wounded. He's getting ready for the, for the narrow gauge train to take him to the regulator station, to the hospital. So they're giving him refreshments, coffee, or, or whatever. They took care of him however, however they could. And that's how they moved them around at the front. You can see another car here. And I have another photo that will show the, these little cars that were around at, at the front. Okay. Uh, here again, the, the dead soldiers, where we put on these little trams. Here again, the Knights of Columbus would tend to them. Notice that the Knights were in army uniforms. When Knights of Columbus were at the front, they had no rank or insignia, but they were in army uniforms and they, had, they were subject to military law. Because once you were at the front, you were subject to military law. I'm often asked, well, were there women at the front? No. No civilian was permitted anywhere in what they call the zone of the armies. That is within 20 miles of the front. No civilians, period. And that's how come the Knights of Columbus, who of course were technically civilians, but they had to be put into army uniforms and obey army law, even having the overseas caps, you see, and whatnot. They had to wear the entire uniform at all times at the front. They were in the army, so to speak, because only the army could be in that zone of the armies at the front. No civilians whatsoever. If you have a civilian engineer go to look at a bridge or something, Army uniform, army law. This is in Russia. This is an old style Russian steam locomotive. And this, these are trains of people escaping to Vladivostok from Siberia. Whole trains of people suffering from typhus would be on these trains. And these trains were operated by United States volunteers and they were protected by the United States Army. This is the Trans-Siberian Railroad, operated by the United States. Next slide. Here you can see, look at these people coming off the trains in boxcars to be taken care of at Vladivostok. The United States had hospitals in Siberia and at Vladivostok all the way to Omsk. In fact, the United States operated the largest hospital in Siberia at that time. This is no train. But I just wanted to show you, this is the United States flag in Siberia. We were invited by the provisional government. Actually, the imperial government invited us. Then the provisional government invited us. And when, tri when Lenin took over and, this, and the communists took over the, the, Soviet, made the Soviet Union, Trotsky invited the United States into Russia to operate trains. So we were invited there to operate their trains, and we did. It's an incredible story, and just most fortunate to stumble upon it. Okay, look at this. What uniform is that? Yeah, 
Do you know this is about 500 miles inland in France? This is at a regulating station. Can you see the supplies piled up in back there? Notice where we have narrow gauge track where it meets standard gauge track. What was that sailor doing that far inland? That gob belongs on the ocean, right? And then look at this guy wearing a civilian suit standing with this Navy brass. The captains, commanders, here's this guy right in the middle there, that hat. There you could see him better. There now he's not only with the Navy, he's with the Army generals. Who's that guy? Pershing. Who? Pershing. No, it's not John J. Pershing. Hoover. No. Hmm? Who? No, he wasn't. No. Look closely. Oh, Howard Hughes. No, not Howard Hughes. He's the next war. <laughs> Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Oh my gosh. He was assistant secretary of the Navy, and he went to France to carry the gun that's going to win the war. And it was a it was a railroad gun that's going to be the key to the United States winning the war. There's a whole train. This gun took a whole train of sailors to operate it. You know that? On land at the front in France, the sailors operated the big gun. What am I talking about big gun? We might have another photo. Let me see if we have another. Oh, how about, is that clearer for you? Yeah. I'm not kidding you, right? Yeah. That is Franklin Roosevelt. Of course, that's before polio, right? I like that hat he's wearing, huh? Right? Assistant Secretary of the Navy. There's just a side, there's part of the gun. Sailor standing there. That's a big gun. That gun had a bore of 15 inches. It shot an artillery shell that weighed 1,400 pounds. Accurately 20 miles, 21, over 20 miles. You see, that gun was in critical for winning the war, and it was planned that way. By the way, the gun carriage could move at only three miles an hour and was built by the Baldwin Locomotive Works. That gun, and it was Pershing's idea, was not to use the, that gun to fire on the German troops in the trenches. What he did was he shot that gun to hit their supplies. Because you understand that 20 miles to the front, there was nothing. And where there was something, it was contaminated by poison gas. You couldn't eat it. You couldn't drink it. So if you cut off their supplies, there's not only no ammo, there's no food, and there's no water. So the Germans have to retreat. That was how we won World War I. Pershing himself states that. That is not my opinion. That's John J. Pershing's opinion. And John J. Pershing's opinion counts. Mine doesn't. His counts. OK? Who is this guy? McAdoo. He's the one who's going to be responsible for taking over the nation's railroads. By the way, he was the one who created the um, Federal Reserve System. And by the way, just to keep it all in the family, he married Wilson's daughter, President Wilson's daughter. Let's keep it all in the family, right? And don't, you know, there's, there's a mystery. McAdoo wanted to run for the presidency in 1920, and Woodrow Wilson would not support him. Mmm, what was going on there? We'll never know. We'll never know. But he actually was the one in charge of the nation's railroads after the government took them over. Ah, what is this? This uh, uh, is a photo taken during World War II. This is the car in which the armistice was signed. This World War I was a railroad war. It was a railroad war because 
it, it demanded massive, not only numbers of men in the millions, but the incredible supplies never before seen in warfare. And the only way you could move all that tonnage and men on land was by train. So it was a railroad war, and the war ends in a railroad carriage. And the forest of Compiègne in France. And I got a little story, a little braggadocio to tell here. Come on. This is a replica of that car. And it's because Hitler had that car burned. The surrender of France to Germany in World War II was signed in that car. Hitler had that car moved from, Fran from a museum in Paris, that's that previous picture, to Compiègne to make the, the French sign their surrender in the car where they made the Germans sign their surrender. So there's actually a museum, they call uh, La Mosée uh, d'Armistice in France. And I got this, and I, and I got to brag a little bit. Katie, you don't mind, do you, if I brag a little bit? <laughs> if I brag too much, she can hit me over the head if she wants, okay? Here's the deal. Found out about this, and I saw these pictures, you know, in the museum. So I said, okay, what have I got to lose? I got their, their you know, email address. And I hadn't written in French in 30 years, so kind of rusty. So I wrote to them in French, and I asked if I could have permission to purchase these photos to be used because I'm doing lectures on railroads of World War I. Within 12 hours, I got a response from them. Any American who could write to us in French to request pictures, you could have them for free. <laughs> so, so, so I got a whole slew of these photos, huge files. But this was the car in which the uh, replica of the car in which the armistice was signed, was, was signed. And actually, it was the private car of Field Marshal Ferdinand Foch. This was his private car, which was signed. And we could see a little bit. Uh, I, I did a program at the Czech National Czech Museum in Cedar Rapids. And the, the women there just liked this so much, they gave me some extra Czech photos to show. Uh, this is what they call the Czech Legion. Uh, and this is how Czechoslovakia was born, if any of you have Czech descent or the Slovak descent. Uh, there were six, over 6,000 Czech soldiers in the Austro-Hungarian army that surrendered to the Russians on the promise that they would get back to Europe fight for the Allies in World War I, and at the, at the peace conference it would be created a new nation of Czechoslovakia. And this was why, one of the big reasons why the United States was eager to send our railroad workers and soldiers to get these men out of Russia back to France to fight for the Allies so we could have the new country of Czechoslovakia. So the ladies uh, put these photos on. This is called the Czech Legion. I, I can't believe that Hollywood has not made a movie of this. I just can't believe it. But then some of the movies I see from Hollywood, I can believe it anymore, you, you know? <laughs> this would make a phenomenal story. This whole story about the United States and World War I railroads would be a great, great movie. See, they, they, they actually were riding on the Trans-Siberian Railroad. The United States and the United States American Red Cross assisted them. Okay, Let's see what they have. So they even set up their own bakeries and everything in the cars. Very, just very, very resourceful. Okay, yeah. The United States got into World War I. It had already been going on in Europe, right? They've been fighting in Europe from 1914, the, the, actually the end of summer 1914, technically. Uh, on through 1917 when the United States joins. We begin sending soldiers over in, at the end of 1917, okay? In other words, we had to, uh, we at first thought we would get volunteers, that didn't work, and then we had to institute a draft of the young men. But here's the situation. How were we gonna get our young men? Because the French said we want 100,000, then they said they wanted half a million. A Couple of months later, they said they wanted a million. Two months later, they said they wanted two million. In 1918, they said they wanted four million. How are you gonna get all these men, and don't forget these men eat, right? How are you gonna get them 
from the Atlantic Ocean ports inland 500 miles to the front. The French said, oh, we'll just take them by train. The United States got over there and said, the French railroads are nowhere, nowhere near being able to transport our soldiers. And the French looked at them and said, you're right. <laughs> we can't do this. So what the United States did is not only were drafting men in the army and whatnot, we actually were, were building a situation that the United States would construct railroads in France. We actually, the United States imported into France 4,000 miles of rail, 10,000 switches, thousands of locomotives and freight cars. So as our men arrived in, in France, they were being supported, transported on our equipment. Then we built hospitals. Then we actually had hospital trains made to run on the French tracks. This is something, this is a dirty little secret. You, you know, many of you, I know uh, some of you rail fans know that the gauge of track is four foot, eight and a half inches, right? The French standard gauge was four foot, eight and 11 sixteenth inches. <laughs> And people have always asked me, and I've done research on this, why 11 sixteenths? And the only conclusion is they're French. <laughs> <laughs> they have to have a little bit different, a little bit different. Some say it's to prevent the Germans from invading. No, that's not the case at all. Because you could use a car of eight, eight, four foot, eight and a half inches, will run on 11 sixteenths track, um, the one, four foot eight, and 1116 track, it could run on it, and we did. We ran our cars on their track, except the hospital trains. We did gauge them to that 1116, the hospital trains. We had to be careful going through switches, but we actually ran trains. And not only that, the French system was so inefficient that they only took trains, the whole train and locomotive, from one railroad station to the other. They did not have centralized traffic control. They didn't have the block signals the way we had them set up. You can imagine how inefficient that was. You had to, the locomotive and train crew then turned back and went to the other station. When we started, we started, no, we're going to run train crews all the way through. We actually put in signals on their tracks to run through trains. How about this one? The French put their water and coaling towers right on their main line. So if a train was coming through and had to get coal and water, other trains had to wait. So what did we do? We built sidings. We put up in our own coaling towers. We put up our own water towers so that a train that needed water or coal went on the siding, got its coal, and other trains could pass. The United States built tracks 1,300 miles of track in France. That's the distance between New York and Marshalltown and even going west. Plus 1,000 miles of sidings. Plus, plus over 200 miles of narrow gauge and operated that. We did all of that in France. Now, when I said to you that the United States won the war, I am not saying that from a tactical, and I can quote General Pershing, but also the German generals said it too. The Germans said, the Americans coming into the war, the Americans won the war. Do you know that in 1918, that the Germans were within 48 <coughs> miles of Paris? and going strong at Chateau Thierry. The French were in full retreat. In fact, they evacuated one million people from Paris. Every general from the British and the French said, Germans get Paris, they won the war. You know who stopped them? American Marines. They said, we came here to fight, not to retreat. 
and we stopped the Germans called at Chateau Thierry. And then it was our soldiers in Pershing's tactics and that big gun that destroyed the German supplies that pushed the Germans back so that by September, end of September of 1918, the German generals in uh, the letters to prove it said, this is over. Those Americans are just coming at us like crazy. Pershing had the idea of not just using the artillery to hit trenches and all that. What he would do is he actually shot the artillery and then had our men come right under the artillery barrages. What they were doing in the war, they were shooting the artillery, artillery stopped, then you had over the top in the charge. But here our men followed the artillery so that the Germans couldn't attack them. Plus, we demolished all their supplies. End of the war. End of the war. And as far as the Trans-Siberian Railroad, do you know that the United States actually ran hospital trains? American Red Cross ran six hospital trains and supplied hospitals with American donations in Siberia. The rule was that no matter what their politics, no matter what their army, if anyone approaches a hospital train, needs medical or dental care, they would simply get it for free. The United States, the Red Cross, now understand this is $1918, okay? The Red Cross collected $200,000 from Americans for medical supplies to be used in the hospital trains in Siberia. And how about this? Americans donated $3.5 million worth of coats, mittens, and hats for the Russian people during the war to be distributed by the Red Cross from the hospital trains. It kept them warm. It kept them warm. And we also sent ships and gathered and purchased milk and food for infants that we sent even to St. Petersburg during the war to help, to help them out. But there's another side to this story. I mean, there's so much to this story, and, and I do have it in my book, but I, I, I want you to think about this. The United States had about 8,000 soldiers under the command of General William Groves in Siberia. We were to guard the Trans-Siberian Railroad to get those Czech Legion soldiers out of there to keep supplies going from Vladivostok to European Russia so that the Russians wouldn't starve, so that they would have supplies. We had to keep that, keep that track open. But there was another group of people there that weren't interested just keeping the track open. They wanted the track for themselves. They were the Japanese. The Japanese and the United States often fired upon each other in Siberia. That's right, because the Japanese wanted to take over Eastern Siberia for itself. And though not part of its mission, the United States kept, kept the Japanese from making Eastern Siberia into a colony. Can you imagine World War II if the Japanese had all the foodstuffs and mineral wealth of Siberia to work with, to bomb with? You know, this, this was unknowing on the part of the United States, but we kept them at bay until finally when we left in 1920, last in 1921, the Soviet government were able to finally kick them out later on. But there were two groups of our soldiers that particularly were in Siberia and did take pot shots from the Japanese. And that was the 27th Infantry that was stationed in California. And then they were later moved to Hawaii and the 37th in the Philippines. And by irony of irony, of all history, they were the first American soldiers to be bombed during Pearl Harbor. When the Japanese broke, bombed Pearl Harbor, just by chance, the soldiers they fought in Siberia and the ones brought up from the Philippines were the ones to get hit first during World War II. History 
to me, is far more exciting and it's far more mystery than any novel. Actually, when I was a youngster, even a teenager, I, uh, one railroad, I, I used to ride into New York City for music lessons, and it had a toilet, too, that you saw the tracks. Yeah, so. The other thing is, is that their timing has, got, has not gotten any better over the years. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, it, it, you know, it really is a shame too. Like our Amtrak too, with timing, you know, too is a shame too. So I'm very sorry to hear that this update. So it hasn't changed much since World War One, apparently. Probably the same car. Yeah, I, I, I think Lenin would be very upset. I think. It may be time for one. I hear we have time for one more uh, uh, question or comment. And I think, gentlemen, well, this gentleman here hasn't had a chance. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. When we were over in France, and that, do we have to purchase our fuels from them, or did we supply our own? Okay, good question about fuels. Yes, good question. Fuel was a problem in France because they had a very low-grade coal. You know, coal has different grades. And they were using like a brownish coal. I think it's referred to as lignite or a form of lignite. And when you're talking about a low-grade coal, it doesn't have the BTUs, doesn't have the heat firing, you know, capacity in creating heat for a boiler. Okay. Uh, so what what the United States did, uh, a, a, as well as the French, by the way, and the British, was we had to import coal from England. Uh, and it got so, it, it, you know, this is one of these stories of World War I. It got so bad that, um, and coal got in such a situation that it, the, the low, low commodities, that, that is, so, so few coal, that they literally had to stop drafting coal miners. So they had enough coal miners then to go in the mines to, run, to get the coal. Became that critical. So we had to use Br British coal, uh, uh, you know, to run our locomotives efficiently, uh, and, and that was a high enough grade. We did not send our own coal over. We had problems just sending our own men and equipment over. Uh, although, although the United States did, and I think we still do, export coal to, to Europe. We still have ships that take coal to Europe. When I taught in Germany, I was informed that the school in which I taught was heated by United States coal. That really warmed my heart. <laughs> <laughs> so very good. Okay, uh, I can remain a few minutes. Some of you have a question or comment you want to say to me or whatever. Two other things to beg your indulgence and I ask permission, Katie. Um, I have a Facebook thing, page or whatever. I don't manage it. You don't want me to manage anything on the computer, okay? It's professionally managed. Every week there's new photos of anything about World War I, and there's a new, every week there's a uh, one sentence or two sentence thing about something, aspect of World War I. So I'm gonna like to ask you to like me on Facebook. Those of you who are Facebookers, like me on Facebook. It's called The Great Railroad War. This is the book, it has over, over 100 photos, so in other words, many more photos than, are, than we showed here, the ones here and then many, many others. Uh, and it's the only book on United States rail activities during World War I. And I have some, some flyers that I would love to hand out to you and ask you to order, if you would order the book uh, online, it has the address there. The, uh, the company, the Garbley Publishing Company, they're very good. They'll get you the book within the week by priority mail. So they're very good. So I'd like to ask you to take a folder and please buy the book and whatnot, okay? Um, what do I say? It's all aboard. And this time, Chicago and Northwestern pulling the city of San Francisco to points east, <coughs> leaving Council Bluffs. Marshalltown has their special parlor car with snacks and adult beverages. Thank you, you've been a great audience, thank you. All aboard.